and a pleasant good morning to all of you. Guy thought he might be sick a couple weeks ago or a week and a half ago, and I was on standby to come and maybe do a short message. And that short message turned into preaching today, uh, just so that Guy could have a little break. And um, I enjoyed uh, preparing for this, and I just wanted you to know that this message spoke to my heart tremendously, so I'm in this with you. So I think it's a little bit of a hard message, because we're talking about sin. But first we're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit versus the power of sin, and then we're going to talk about the remedy, which most of you know where I'm, where I'm going with that. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that we have your word to guide us, to teach us, to convict us, to give us hope, to show us that your grace is sufficient and that your mercies are new every morning. Bless your people today, Lord. Help us to be comforted by what Christ has done on our behalf. Help us to not hide our sin and be deceived by our enemy. Help us to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. So I could not get my mind free of the, the way that so many of us in the church continue to struggle with sin in our lives, and even my own life. So when we're talking about the Holy Spirit and the power that he's supposed to bring into our lives so that we can walk in newness of life, how many of us are actually walking in that newness of life daily? I believe one of the reasons we struggle with sin is because the enemy is very crafty. He wants to keep us away from knowing the power that God has given us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Th three main points I'm going to be giving you today. Um, you just have to jot these down, at least in your mind, and that's how I'll move through this. The, there is power for living from the Holy Spirit. The second one is sin has power. And the third one is Jesus' blood has power to cleanse us from every sin. So, now, most of us here know that Jesus had power over everything he came in contact with. He had power to resist the devil and all his temptations when he went into the desert. He had power over the blind man. He had power over the lame man. He had power over the deaf and dumb man. He had power over the demon-possessed man. Power over the sick boy from a distance. Power over the storm and the waves. Power over the dead boy at his funeral. Power over Lazarus, who was dead for four days. Power over the soldiers who came to arrest him. Power to forgive those who were crucifying him. Power over death as he rose again three days later. Oh yes, we believe Jesus had power. And we believe he was God in the flesh. But sometimes we forget that he was also a man. He was the God-man. And at the beginning of his ministry, when he was baptized by John the Baptist, we read this in Matthew. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Jesus had the Holy Spirit given to him from the Father. And that's when Jesus' ministry began. And he started by going into the desert for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. And he was successful. Sometimes we wish Jesus was right here by our side. Sometimes it seems if Jesus was just right here by my side, I could get through this next moment that is feeling too hard for me right now. When Jesus said, it is good for you that I go away, the ESV actually says it like this, it is to your advantage that I go away. For then I will send the Holy Spirit and he will guide you into all truth. So as Pastor Guy has been saying to us, the Holy Spirit in us is better 
than Jesus being beside us. You talk about power. Paul tells us that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that lives in us. And he will give life to our mortal bodies. The third person of the Trinity who comes into our being is the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. That is power. And he promises to give life to our mortal bodies. Yes, eternal life is promised, but more than that, he promised to lead us into all truth and to make us more and more like Jesus himself. So how's that going? I asked myself that question. So why are there so many in the family of God overcome by sin and repeated failures and broken marriages and broken relationships with kids and broken relationships within the church? The power to overcome sin in our lives is found in this very truth. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the very same spirit that lives in us now. If indeed we have trusted in Jesus and believed in him. So if that's true and the Bible tells us that it is, why is it so many of us in the family of God struggle and lose the battle with sin in our lives daily? The word of God tells us in James that one of the reasons we fight and quarrel amongst ourselves is because we desire and do not have, so we commit murder. We covet and cannot obtain, so we fight and quarrel. We don't have because we don't go to God to ask. And when we do ask, we do not receive because we ask wrongly to spend it on our own passions. We would all agree that we are just sinners saved by grace. And that's true. We are sinners saved by grace. But for many of us, the story ends there. For many of us, we've grown weary in trying. We sin, confess, repent, repeat. For many of us, we have tried to fight the good fight, but we seem to be losing more often than we're winning. For some of us, we are tired of the struggle and we simply don't feel it's worth the struggle anymore. We're tempted to give up, stop reading our Bibles, stop coming to church, stop being with other believers. We are living as defeated Christians who just keep coming back for more grace over and over again. Amen for more grace. And where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. That's another whole series of messages just on the topic of grace itself. But listen to what Paul said. Shall I continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. May it never be. How can we who died to sin still live in it? There's the big question. How can we live for God if we are living in sin? We can't. And the devil knows that. What I want us to do now is look at the way our enemy, the devil, seeks to destroy us by keeping us bound by sin, even if he can just keep us going through the revolving door of sin, confess, sin, confess, over and over again without ever gaining victory over our besetting sins. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 3. Very familiar part of the Bible. You know it well. It might be almost too familiar as you read it, though. And you might be tempted to just skim through it because you know it so well. So let's take some time and look at it a little closer. Here's a thought that I had. Based on Satan's first lie and Eve's response to it, I believe that we can diagnose every other lie that the devil uses to try to lead us away from the truth. There are several steps to sin. And I want us to see how Satan used them on Eve and how these same steps are used as he tries to get us to disobey God and sin. This serpent, or snake, it's a real created creature created that God 
made this creature. And some say it was a snake already, and some say it became a snake after God cursed it later on. But either way, it is controlled by Satan himself. And it's a, it's a tool that he's using to tempt Eve. And the Bible is very clear that it is the craftiest creature that God had made. The dictionary defines crafty this way. Clever at achieving one's aims by indirect or deceitful methods. Sounds like the devil, doesn't it? Have you ever been crafty? I think we've all been that way at one time or another, but Satan here, he's the craftiest of them all. Verse 1, Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? We already know what God said. And you can see here that the first temptation is to question what God has said. And notice the quote that the serpent gives is not even correct. So he misquotes God. The first step towards sin is questioning God's word. Did God actually say? The very first thing Satan wants us to do is to question what God has said. So Eve, who was still holy and without sin at this point, she has a thought that maybe I better check this out myself. I don't think the thought itself is sin yet, but she's being tempted to doubt God. Do we ever question what God has said? I would like to suggest that every time we are tempted to sin, that we are questioning what God has said. Did God really mean do not lie? Did God really mean do not commit adultery? Did God really mean I need to honor my parents? Did God really mean to love my neighbors as myself? And every one of his commands are for our good. And for our life to be blessed. So what is temptation? Here's a definition. I'll say it twice. A situation in which one experiences a challenge to choose between fidelity and infidelity to one's obligations toward God. A situation in which one's experiences in which one experiences a challenge to choose between fidelity and infidelity to one's obligations toward God. Fidelity would simply be faithfulness to God's rule, and likewise, infidelity would be unfaithfulness. So, when we are tempted, we are actually considering, I have no obligations before God. We are saying, although you made me, you don't know what's best for me. What a crazy thought, huh? That our creator God doesn't know what is best for us. That's very hard to admit, but when we question God's word, that's just what we're doing. We come to the second step, deception. The second thing Satan does is he makes a truth into a half-truth. Notice what happens here. You shall not eat of any tree. That's his deception. God did not say that, but Satan puts it forth as though maybe that's what he really said. Doubt begins to creep in. I'm not sure exactly when sin entered Eve's heart, but I'm thinking maybe not quite yet. Now that she begins to think about it, she tries to quote God, and she adds something to what he said. Neither shall you touch it. Maybe Adam, in talking to Eve, said this to her one day as he was simply trying to set some rules about staying away from that tree. Don't you even touch that tree, Eve. Don't forget, the tree was in the midst of the garden. Not way off on the edge, not in the back part of it, right in the middle. God was revealing something by making the, the rule simple. Don't eat it. Surely they could look at it. They had to walk by it every day, as it were. It's in the middle of the garden, and they're taking care of the garden. We tend to make rules, don't we? Um, the Pharisees said, don't pick corn on the Sabbath. Uh, 
some groups will tell us how long your dress should be. Some say, don't drink this or don't eat that. But we need to be careful to say what God says. We need to think about that a little bit. And so Eve gives this quote as though God said it. Verse 3, she said, she says that God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So now, even touching the tree can kill you. Maybe it would be a good thing not to go near the tree. And maybe Adam did say to Eve, um, that maybe he said that to Eve, but uh, in Eve's mind, which is now beginning to rethink this whole touching thing, and while she's thinking about it, the devil goes for the kill, and there's a pun intended here. You shall not surely die. There it is. That's the big lie. This is absolutely in direct op opposition to what God said. The serpent goes on in his big deception. Verse 5, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This is actually a half-truth. Oh, yes, their eyes would be opened, but they would not be like God. They, they already were like God. Now, if they do this, they would not be like God. For then they would sin and they would become sinners. So Eve is thinking about this command of God and now she has added something to God's word that seems to make it more unreasonable. This is my own thought here. You know, adding, adding rules and regulations, and it's easy to pick those things apart. Well, we can't even pick corn on, on s Sunday or Saturday, whatever the Pharisees were thinking. We, we tend to think this way. She's now beginning to doubt what God really said, and she now appeals to her own senses. It's not good when we start to appeal to our own senses when we're being tempted. Here's where we find the way of the world expressed. It started right here in Genesis. The Apostle John wrote about this in 1 John. He said, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh... And the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Your King James says it like this, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. We're probably more used to hearing it like that. Let's see how these three ways of the world uh, work to lead us to sin. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, verse 6, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Notice what it said. It was good for food. The first physical temptation. It was good for food. God made it. It was among all the other trees that were good for food too. Only this one was prohibited by God. God's world God's rules. When, when we coddle desire, it will bring about sin. If we play lightly with desire, it will bring about sin. Remember what we read earlier in James. But each person is tempted when he, when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then, when desire, then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin... And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. The Bible calls this the lust of the flesh, the desire of the flesh. You're at a restaurant eating dinner. Let's say you're on a diet. Most of us can put ourselves in this scenario. Now this example can represent any sin you want it to. Sexual impurity, lying, stealing, coveting. You put your sin in here, okay? So you're sitting there, eating your keto diet meal, and the kid at the next table is getting dessert, and he has a big three-scoop banana split. Okay. You look at it. It looks good. You want it, but it's not yours. You keep desiring it. Now you can't take your eyes off of it. 
Your stomach growls. It would be good for me, you say. It would be good, but it's not yours. There's a temporary pleasure to all sin. That's part of the deception. Can you imagine what would happen if you, you reached over at that restaurant and grabbed that kid's uh, three-scoop banana split? There'd be a lot, a lot of trouble going on in that restaurant, wouldn't there? As Eve looks at the fruit, she starts to think, hey, this fruit would satisfy my hunger. Never mind that all the other trees that were made to satisfy her need for food are there. But there's something about that one tree. I think maybe the serpent is right. She thinks, why not eat this fruit too? This will be good for me. She's being deceived. She also sees that it's a delight to the eyes also. Eve continues to ponder the tree in light of the deceptive statements that the serpent spoke to her. She saw the beauty of the tree. I think all the fruit trees that God made had their own unique beauty to them, and this one was no different. This was not a tree with spikes on it. This wasn't an ugly tree. It wasn't a, a bad tree. It was a good tree. The fruit was good on it. God simply said, don't eat this fruit. How could it be bad if it looks so good? She's being led down the road to sin, and she doesn't know it yet. This is the lust of the eyes. So at the restaurant, while desiring that banana split because you were hungry, the lust of the flesh, we see that it's just covered in hot fudge, and it looks so delicious. You have to have it. I need to talk about pornography right here. This is how pornography lures us. It's the same strategy. Something God made that was beautiful inside the covenant of marriage is now being used to lure you to sin against your spouse, your future spouse, and the people you are being used, the people that are being used in this filthy industry to profit off of your lust. And confessing this sin to a trusted believer is the only way to break the sin cycle of pornography. It will destroy your marriage. It will destroy your ministry. It will hurt the people that you don't even know. But we're not done yet. Lastly, she saw that it was to be desired to make one wise. The pride of life. To be one up on everybody. Now, our example, in our example of the banana split, it may be harder to see how the pride of life fits in here, but basically, when we see ourselves as being in charge of our own happiness, we tend to disregard the well-being of others. The pride of life says, I deserve this. This is what will make me truly happy and fulfilled. Now, don't forget, we are not just talking about this banana split. I want us thinking about our own sins, particularly our own besetting sins. I can't go on in this situation. I need to change it. I need to have it. I can't live without it. I, I, I. You hear it? This is the pride of life. Me. Not thinking of others. Not thinking about what God says. Or simply not believing what God says. I know better than my maker. This was solely based on the lie of the serpent. The thought was put in her mind that she would be like God if she ate the fruit, knowing good and evil. She began to think, I know better than God. The very same temptation that grew in the mind of the devil is, as he thought at one time, soon after he was created, he thought that he would be like the Most High God. Self-seeking glory, the pride of life, the devil knows now that he will never be like God, for God was able to have him cast down from heaven. And even the demons, the other fallen angels, they know that their fate is sure. Remember when Jesus cast out the demons of the two men in Matthew, they cried out to him, What have we to do? What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Satan knows his days are numbered too, and he desires to take as many souls with him as he can. 
Eve was deceived and she believed the lie. She was lured by the tempter and caught, just like a fish. The fish is fooled by the bait that disguises the hook. And, and what do we call it? It's a, a lure. Go get your fishing tackle. Pick out the best lure that you can get. Pick out the lure that will make the fish think that this will be good for them. And it's hiding a hook all the time. And this is what temptation is doing to us. It's making it seem as though it will be good for me. And yet there's a hook in it that can lead us to death ultimately. Eve took the bait and she gave it to Adam and, and he took also and he ate. This all took place in chapter 3 of Genesis and then the whole rest of the Bible is God's redemptive plan of history. What did, uh, God did what he said. Adam and Eve died spiritually that very day and eventually they died physically. And death is all around us. We live across the street from a funeral home. It's a business. They can count on it. There's going to be somebody there next week. It could be me. My wife thinks she might get a discount because she can just wheel me across the street and save a few dollars, I guess. I don't know. But so much in our life is about trying to avoid death. We go to the doctors. We take pills. We try to exercise. We try to eat right. We don't want to die. We want to stay alive. But the devil wants to kill us. He wants death to come to us. Listen to what Matthew Henry says. Satan teaches men first to doubt, then to deny. The devil draws people into his interest by suggesting to them hard thoughts of God and false hopes of advantage to sinning. The devil promises advantage from their eating this fruit. He aims to make them discontented with their present state as if it were not so good as it might be and should be. No condition will of itself bring content unless the mind be brought to it. He tempts them, this is Henry, he tempts them to seek preferment as if they were fit to be God's. So we started out talking about the power of the Holy Spirit and that this same Holy Spirit is the one who lives in you now if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as your Savior. One of the main works that the Holy Spirit does is it speaks of Christ to our hearts and our minds. Jesus said, but, but when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. This really is the main source of power as God works in our hearts to make us more into the image of his dear son. The Holy Spirit is going to speak of Christ to us. As we read his word, as we learn of him, the Holy Spirit reminds us of him. He reminds us of who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. He's called the helper because he comes alongside us and he enlightens us to these truths and reminds us over and over again what Christ has done for us. And just as there was not anything in the temple that was not cleansed with the sprinkling of blood, so it is that there are, so it is that we who are coming to Jesus for cleansing are cleansed by the sprinkling of his blood to be cleansed from our sins by the blood of Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the uh, sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Remember when Cain killed Abel? And the Lord came to Cain and he asked him, Where, where's your brother? And the Lord said to him that his blood cries out to the ground. And the Lord was aware of it, he knew of it, he heard it, he knew what was going on. Well, remember now that if, if we have put our trust in Jesus, then his blood cries out too. His blood cries out, paid in full. This is where the power of the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Because when we find ourselves caught in sin, 
It tells us in John, it was one of my new favorite verses, John 1, 16. It gives us grace upon grace. You find yourself caught in sin. You can't say, but he won't forgive me the next time. You, you have to have his forgiveness. You have to go back to Jesus. You have to confess your sin. You need to repent of your sin. Grace upon grace. Because the blood of Jesus Christ has been spilt, and if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, that blood cries out for you. And that's your answer to the devil. When he comes to you and he says, you're no good, look what you've done. Look how you failed. Look what you keep doing. You can't do this. You're no good. Our answer to the hymn is, the blood, it speaks for me. God has heard the blood of Jesus Christ. And he said that it would pay for all my sins. And I believe that. And I know most of you believe that too. And this is the power that we have with the Holy Spirit in us to remind us of these things. So if you're still outside of Christ today and you're here among us today, or if you're listening, won't you put your faith and hope in this Christ that we've been talking about? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Let's pray.